It seems a funny thing to say, but if you want to be a fiction writer, you should be good at writing. On its face, that may be the most obvious of all the obvious things I've said in this entire collection of lessons, and I've said some flagrantly obvious things, I know. Yet, I think this doesn't get said nearly enough to aspiring writers. Many, many, many aspiring writers out there can barely put together a passable sentence, let alone a good one let alone the occasional great sentence. And even rarer is the writer who can string great sentences together consistently. And of those who do, there are probably fewer still who could demonstrate what they're doing and teach another writer how to do the same. Now, I'm not about to claim that I'm the greatest sentence artist who has ever lived, far from it. And I'm certainly not even the foremost expert in the lessons I'll be conveying here on sentence construction. But I can hold my own, and I can teach you the basics of how you can learn to do the same. This, like any other aspect of writing fiction, is a skill that can, and should, be mastered by the aspiring writer. The words on the page are important. They are the currency that changes hands in the telepathic dance you and your reader are engaged in. And if you step on their toes with your clunky prose, well, they're just going to go looking for a younger, hotter partner who can actually salsa. Let's face it, your readers don't owe you anything, but you owe it to them to take them for a pleasurable spin. You lead, and you better get comfortable in that role if you're not already. Now, you might think that the subject of writing sentences is dry as hell and you'd rather be doing literally almost anything else. But if you really want to do this fiction writing thing, and you really want to do it well, you're going to want to stick around for the lessons in this section. I'm going to show you how you can start on the path toward becoming a master of sentences. If you're anything like I was for the first few years I was writing seriously, you probably don't have a good sense for how you form your sentences. You, as a certain Oregonian sneaker company would say, just do it. And just doing it is fine as you're getting started. That's actually not a terrible analogy, either, running. Why anyone with two legs can get themselves a pair of fancy sneakers and go bombing down some trail into the woods, huffing and puffing and swinging their arms and legs about, And in the end, they'll get a damn good workout in, whether they're naturally hair-fast or tortoise-slow. But if you've ever had the chance to see a real foot race of any distance at virtually any level of competition, you'll notice something about the runners at the front of the pack. They glide. Smooth, efficient, controlled movement. Practiced form. A calculated, calm rhythm about their stride. They do lots of exercises to perfect their form. They hone their craft with intention, and if you want to keep up with the big dogs in the front of the pack, you're going to have to learn how to hone your craft as well. Enough with the analogies, Ro. What are you getting at? Okay, sentences, as I mentioned way back in the introduction to this whole crazy affair, are a combinatorial system. This means that you can create an infinite number of possible sentences using the fundamental underlying structural rules that govern sentence construction. And, as complex as that may sound, there are only a handful of different options the writer has when building a sentence. Yes, the words can certainly always change, and yes, you can choose to say literally anything. But there are only a finite number of grammatical ways you can form sentences, and we're going to look at all of those ways here. And with a little practice, you'll realize you're no longer struggling to figure out how to say what you want to say. You'll be a world champion marathoner of a sentence builder, just gliding along while all the weekend warriors behind you are staggering their way through nine-minute miles. Oh, sorry. I said enough with the analogies. Bad row. All right. I have to take one important related tangent before we get to the actual brief primer to the lessons that follow. And it's a philosophical tangent at that. Sorry. The following is a quote from the great John Erskine in his essay, The Craft of Writing. Let me suggest here one principle of the writer's craft which, though known to practitioners, I have never seen discussed in print. The principle is this. When you write, you make a point not by subtracting, as though you've sharpened a pencil, but by adding when you put one word after another. Your statement should be more precise the more you add. If the result is otherwise, you've added the wrong thing, or you've added more than was needed. As with any philosophical matter, There are multiple schools. I decided to include the Erskine quote above because it runs counter to the philosophical school that seemed to dominate the 20th century, at least in the discussion of craft. 
One of the first axioms of writing that young writers are likely to encounter is still this one. You're probably familiar. Omit needless words. That declaration comes from Strunk and White's Elements of Style, which is still handed out almost reflexively by writing instructors across the English-speaking and writing world. Like most other books on writing, it is full of rules and edicts that outline the style preferences of the authors rather than dealing with the universal challenges of writing. By that I mean this. Needless is a subjective term. There's an epic scene in Milos Forman's 1984 film adaptation of Peter Schaeffer's Tony Award-winning play Amadeus, and this philosophical conundrum always reminds me of it. In the scene, Mozart has just brought down the house with his new opera, and while the emperor is congratulating him on his stunning achievement, he hedges a little by saying that, occasionally, it seems to have, how shall one say, too many notes. I don't understand, Mozart answers. There are just as many notes, Majesty, as I require, neither more nor less. And when the emperor doubles down, Mozart becomes incensed. My dear young man, the emperor says, don't take it so hard. Your work is ingenious, and there are simply too many notes. Just cut a few, and it'll be perfect. Mozart's reply, which notes did you have in mind, Majesty? Absurd, right? The idea of an emperor who could barely play the piano telling the greatest composer who ever lived that his work had too many notes? The only thing more absurd than the idea that such a thing could have happened is that this actually did happen. So please keep that in mind as I read the following passage from the Mozart of sentence construction of the mid-19th century. Some days elapsed, and ice and icebergs all astern, the Pequod now went rolling through the bright Quito spring, which, at sea, almost perpetually reigns on the threshold of the eternal August of the tropic. The warmly cool, clear, ringing, perfumed, overflowing, redundant days were as crystal goblets of Persian sherbet, heaped up, flaked up, with rosewater snow. The starred and stately knights seemed haughty dames in jeweled velvets, nursing at home in lonely pride the memory of their absent conquering earls, the golden-helmeted sons. For sleeping man, t'was hard to choose between such winsome days and such seducing nights. But all the witcheries of that unwaning weather do not merely lend new spells and potencies to the outward world. Inward they turned upon the soul especially when the still mild hours of eve came on. Then, memory shot her crystals as the clear ice most forms of noiseless twilights, and all these subtle agencies, more and more they wrought on Ahab's texture. So, Emperor Strunk, which words should Melville have omitted? Surely some of them are needless in such a flourishing passage of prose. If Melville hadn't predated him and had taken Strunk's writing advice literally, the passage might have read something like this. After many days, the Pequod approached the equator where the weather was perpetually warm and perfect for sleeping. This bothered Ahab. Now, you may very well prefer the Strunk version. That's fine. In that case, you'd be reading a totally different book with a narrator who has a completely different personality, which highlights the point I'm trying to make. Different stories demand different styles, and different writers use different styles. So what does that have to do with the philosophy of sentence composition, you're probably asking at this point? Much of what we'll be discussing here has to do with style. Style is a subjective matter. Many readers and writers prefer short sentences that are declarative and neat. This was a popular aesthetic through much of the 20th century as you can find in writers like Hemingway, Flannery O'Connor, or Raymond Carver. On the other hand, you might really enjoy the flourishes with which Melville adorns his epic whaling journey. Or maybe you appreciate some of the modern wizards of sentence construction like Anthony Doerr and Toni Morrison, which is to say nothing of the Faulkners of the world. And there's a lot of space for greatness in between. It's a broad spectrum, to be sure. Here's my two cents. We'll be talking about sentences in the way that the Erskine quote at the beginning frames our conversation. Writing sentences is a process of addition. What a skilled writer can do, and a good writing student's goal should be, is to craft great sentences of any length, from two words to two hundred. Then you'll have the freedom to do what most great writers do. Vary the length and style of your sentences to fit the needs of the story. 
length has very little to do with quality by any subjective measure. It's all about how you form your sentences, not how long you make them. Try to think of your sentences as tools that you use to get a job done. If you use the right tool for the right situation, you'll seldom go wrong. So with all that out of the way, let's get to work on figuring out the ways we can add to basic sentences to make them richer and more interesting. The following is just a brief outline of the lessons we'll cover in this section, which is a systematic review on the art of sentence construction. The sentence is your most basic and widely applied tool. All the other elements of written fiction we've discussed thus far are conveyed to your reader in sentence form, and you're going to get good at writing them. By the end of this section, you should be able to take the information here and figure out what any writer you've ever read is doing at the sentence level. If you don't understand the following brief primer in full, fear not, there'll be a lesson on each of these points to follow that should clear things up. I'm not going to get any more rudimentary than to convey that we'll start by talking about the base clause, which consists of a subject and a predicate, and most times a modifier or two. If you don't know what these things are right now, we'll get into them. And if you're struggling with grammatical terminology along the way, there are plenty of great grammar tutorials to be had on YouTube. Okay, the base clause is the nucleus of every grammatical sentence, something brief like row coughed. Each sentence, no matter how complex or ornate, can be boiled down to a base clause that consists of subject plus predicate. The base clause can be expanded from within by adding one, modifying words or phrases to it, two, by adding interrupters, three, by adding subordinating phrases or clauses, or four, by adding introductory clauses or phrases. The base clause can be expanded externally by adding one, connective clauses using coordinating conjunctions, or a colon or a semicolon. Two, by using subordinate clauses introduced by relative pronouns. And three, by adding loose modifying phrases. If you don't know what these terms are now, fear not. We'll take it one step at a time, and by the end you will. This will all make sense. And that's it. Really, that's it. Underlying every sentence in the English language is some variant of the above set of possibilities. The combination of different choices in modifying the base clause produces all the intricate variation that makes Hemingway Hemingway, Faulkner Faulkner, and you, you. Now all that's left is to make me a better me and you a better you. But there's one more important tangent we need to discuss before getting down to the nitty gritty, and I found it in an old book of all places. God, those things are useful. The topic of reader sensitivity might be intuitive to you. It was to me when I came across the only account of it I've ever seen, in an obscure book by a magazine writer from the early 1980s. The title, How to Write Like a Pro, would likely have evoked a healthy dose of derisive laughter from my MFA colleagues if they'd ever caught me reading it, especially since the author, Barry Tarshish, wasn't exactly Joan Didion, John McPhee, or Don DeLillo. He was a freelance magazine writer who wrote articles about tennis, but damned if he didn't know exactly what he was talking about. Reader sensitivity was something I'd figured out implicitly, but Tarshish's lessons on this topic were exactly on point, and when I started teaching writing to student writers, I knew that this skill was not intuitive to all writers and could be learned. More importantly, reader sensitivity definitely needed to be learned by the writers who didn't practice it intuitively. It's critical to practice if you want to keep your readers reading. The telepathic art, as we've spoken about it here, is like the metaphor I used in the last lesson, a dance. And as a writer, you must lead the dance. Just like in dancing, you can dance with a partner or you can dance alone. If you're leading, you must have a sense of where your partner is in order to take them anywhere. If you don't understand this, you're going to be dancing alone, as in no readers. You don't want to dance with a partner who doesn't care whether you're there, and neither does anyone else. 
You need to get doubly telepathic if you want to lead this dance. You must know what your reader is thinking. That might sound impossible, but it's really just about being sensitive to what thoughts your words are putting into your reader's head. Remember, you're leading, so if you're in control of the words you're putting on the page, you should have an idea of what a reader of those words is thinking. Tarshish puts it like this, I define reader sensitivity as an ongoing awareness of how your readers are processing and reacting to what you've written. It's being able to put yourself in the reader's shoes. It's sensing when the word you've used may not be expressing as clearly as it should the idea or image you're trying to get across. It's sensing when an idea or image you've given your reader is likely to have created a question in the reader's mind, which you must quickly answer. It's sensing when you need to beef up an idea with added details so that your reader will better grasp the importance of the idea. And it's being able to sense when your reader may be getting bored or possibly angry, and knowing what to do to eliminate the boredom or anger. Essentially, reader sensitivity is the practice of anticipating a reader's reaction and writing with this reaction in mind. Far too many writers of all levels forget that writing is an inherently social act. It is a conversation. And you wouldn't just keep talking through your listener's confusion if you were in the room with her. When you're talking, you actually use phrases linguists call phatics to check for understanding and fill in empty spaces, as a way to be sure that your listener is following along. You know what I'm saying? And since the reader isn't in the room with you when you're writing, you need to develop a sense for how an average reader will follow your lead. This is a process that takes place at the sentence level, which is why I mention it here. You have to write good sentences, yes, but they also need to connect to one another through the ideas they convey. I'll show you what I mean. Here's Norman McLean again, talking about fly fishing. Although I have a warm personal feeling for the canyon, it is not an ideal place for me to fish. It puts a premium on being able to cast for distance, and yet most of the time there are cliffs or trees right behind the fisherman, so he has to keep all his line in front of him. It's like a baseball pitcher being deprived of his windup, and it forces the fly fisherman into what is called a roll cast, a hard cast to get distance without throwing any line behind him, and then he has to develop enough power from a short arc to shoot it out across the water. Norman is tightly controlling the reader's thoughts here. He begins by talking about a canyon where his brother and he are going to fish. He finishes the first sentence by stating, It is not an ideal place for me to fish. A reader will get through this statement, not merely understanding that it's not an ideal place for Norman to fish, but also thinking, why not, Norman? And Norman knows this, so he answers. It puts a premium on being able to cast for distance. Then Norman goes on to explain why it's difficult to cast for distance in the canyon. There are cliffs and trees right behind him. Then he offers an analogy to make it clearer. It's like a baseball pitcher being deprived of his wind-up, and a reader might be thinking, so what does a fly fisherman without a wind-up do? Norman answers. It forces the fly fisherman into what is called a roll cast, and before the reader even has time to think, what's a roll cast? Norman lets the reader know. A hard cast to get distance without throwing any line behind him. This is reader sensitivity done well. Norman never lets the reader's thoughts get away from his narrator. He's leading the dance every step of the way. This might be something you do intuitively. Some writers, as I mentioned earlier, just seem to have this important piece built into their prose from day one. Others must learn it. Tarshish uses the analogy of his colleague who gives clear and precise directions, a skill people once needed before the days of GPS. And it's a lot like giving directions. You need to know what ideas or images your reader is thinking about, and also anticipate the turns in the road that might throw them slightly off track. You also must avoid omitting crucial steps. That could throw your reader entirely off track. What does that look like? Well, imagine what Norman's paragraph above might have looked like if he didn't answer the questions the text raised. It might look something like this. Although I have a warm personal feeling for the canyon, it is not an ideal place for me to fish. There are always eagles, elk, and grizzlies in the canyon, but they don't usually get close enough to take a decent picture. It puts a premium on being able to cast for distance, and yet most of the time there are cliffs or trees right behind the fishermen. 
Sometimes it is better to use 12 pound line because the fish in the canyon are big tough fighters. It's difficult to hook anything here if you don't know how to roll cast. Now there's nothing grammatically wrong with the passage I just read, and none of the sentences are terrible or difficult to understand, but there's also no sense of reader sensitivity. I'm not answering the questions the sentences raise. I'm going off track and adding non sequiturs, information that doesn't follow naturally from each previous point. So what's the key difference between what I've done in the paragraph above and what Norman did? Tarshish emphasizes the importance of the reader's focus. He puts it like this. When I talk about the reader's focus, I am talking mainly about whatever idea, image, or point the reader's mind happens to be resting on whenever a sentence ends. In other words, where your reader is. If your intention is to move your reader somewhere else, introduce a new point, etc., you do your reader a valuable service by using that focal point as the connecting link to the next idea or image you're introducing. It's a lot like passing a baton in a relay race. In other words, when you end a sentence by conveying to the reader that the fish in this canyon are tough fighters, the next sentence should convey something about this point, whether you're comparing them to the fish in other spots on the river, or mentioning what species of fish they are that makes them so tough. Something should let your reader know why these fish are tough fighters, because the reader is already moving in that direction. Moving your reader elsewhere is akin to jerking your dance partner back across the floor by the wrist, with no warning. They're not going to tolerate such treatment for long. We'll continue this discussion of reader sensitivity as these lessons on sentences progress. This is merely an introduction to the concept, which I'll refer to from time to time. I could certainly say more about the subject, but I'll be sensitive to the fact that some writers already do this intuitively. And that for those who don't and need more on this topic, Tarshish's clear, detailed, and useful work on the matter can still be had. Writing with the reader's thoughts in your mind may not be intuitive to you, but if your sentences are grammatically correct, and your stories are interesting, and your readers still aren't following along to the very end, then reader sensitivity may be an area you need to focus more on. If you're going to lead this kind of dance, better make it a smooth one. If you want to be the type of writer readers are lining up to dance with, be sensitive. Try not to step on their toes or jerk them by the wrist. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, now. In the primer for these sentence lessons, I mentioned that the base clause is the nucleus of every sentence. All base clauses are made up of the same basic components you should already know, the subject and the predicate. Everything that we do as writers when we build sentences comes back to this basic construction, which we must build around. Let's forego any messing about and examine a sentence to get us started. After many days, the Pequod approached the equator, where the weather was perpetually warm and perfect for sleeping. There's a simple sentence in there. Did you catch it? After many days, the Pequod approached the equator, where the weather was perpetually warm and perfect for sleeping. The simple sentence in there was, the Pequod approached the equator. Everything else in this sentence modifies the main proposition that the Pequod approached the equator. The introductory phrase, after many days, tells the reader when. The subordinate clause, where the weather was perpetually warm and perfect for sleeping, modifies equator, telling the reader something additional about the weather there. The base clause is the basic unit we'll be working with, and even though the number of possible sentences you can form is infinite, the ways that you can extend a sentence beyond the base clause is limited to a few easy, manageable constructions. But before we get to the ways writers can grow sentences beyond their base clauses, we're going to explore a few ways writers expand the base clauses themselves. That's this first lesson, and I'm going to strive to keep it from turning completely into a grammar lesson. So here goes. Here are a few basic sentence kernels. Bobby ran. The candy fell. 
Celia likes hamburgers. The first way we can grow these base clauses is by adding modifying words or phrases to them that add specificity and detail. Bobby ran across the field. The candy fell into the trash can. Celia likes hamburgers better than steak. And you can add modifiers that modify any of the main elements in the base clause. For instance, Bobby the bobsledder ran. The peppermint candy fell. Silly Celia likes hamburgers. Or you could add modifiers to all of the elements of the base clause, like so. Bobby the bobsledder ran across the field. The peppermint candy fell into the trash can. Silly Celia likes hamburgers better than steak. Easy enough, right? Great. The next way we can expand from within the base clause is with a subordinate phrase or clause. And if that grammatical terminology is grading or off-putting, I hope you can appreciate that I'm trying to keep this discussion as simple as possible. You might think of subordinates as specifying phrases or clauses. Its job is to point to a specific element and convey what makes it different. So if I were to give you the sentence, the kids climbed the tree that Jack's grandfather planted, the limiting or specifying information is that Jack's grandfather planted. It lets the reader know exactly which tree the kids climbed, the one Jack's grandfather planted, and not any other tree. Without getting too deep into the grammar weeds here, you can usually recognize subordinate phrases or clauses when you see words like that, which, who, whose, etc. Here's what some subordinate phrases and clauses might look like on those simple sentences we started with. Bobby ran across the field that connects the park with the high school. The peppermint candy that Myra's mother gave her fell into the trash can. Celia likes hamburgers that bleed better than steak that crunches. Sometimes subordinate clauses are set off from the base clause by commas. Bobby, who was very late for class, ran across the field. The candy, which Myra had just taken from her backpack, fell into the trash can. Celia, who gave up on her vegetarian diet last June, likes hamburgers better than steak, which she detests. One of the things we can see from this discussion is that it doesn't take more than a single alteration or two to add a ton of complexity to a very basic sentence. But it's important to remember that no matter how complex the sentence gets, the reader is always looking for the main elements of the base clause to make sense of it. The pith. Everything in the sentence. Celia, who gave up on her vegetarian diet last June, likes hamburgers better than steak, which she detests, comes down to three words. Celia likes hamburgers. When a reader reads Celia, they hold their mental focus on her, wondering, what should I know about Celia? Even as the reader takes in the subordinate information about her vegetarian diet, the reader is looking for the verb to tell them what they need to know about Celia, until they come to likes hamburgers. Ah, she likes hamburgers. Me too. The rest of the sentence consists of details that clarify that main proposition. Okay, there are a couple more important points about how we can grow a base clause. The first is with an interrupting phrase or clause set off by commas or dashes. This can be done in any number of places or ways. A few examples. Tim's behavior, utterly terrible, was a disgrace to all his colleagues. Ted Williams, best known as Teddy Ballgame back in his day, was both a decorated fighter pilot in World War II and a competitive sport fisherman. The shrieks of the seagulls that night in Brunswick Harbor, as obnoxious a noise as I've ever heard in my life, kept me up late into the night. A word of warning here. Interrupt your sentences with care. Often even professional writers end up crafting confusing sentences because they've interrupted their sentences in ways that make them difficult on their reader. One way to avoid this mistake is to make sure the part of the sentence that comes before the dash or commas flows smoothly into the part that comes after. Then make sure the interrupter makes sense with the phrase or clause that follows. See how the above example looks without its interrupter. Ted Williams, best known as Teddy Ballgame back in his day, was both a decorated fighter pilot in World War II and a competitive sport fisherman. Ted Williams was both a decorated fighter pilot in World War II and a competitive sport fisherman. Notice how the subject before the first dash fits perfectly with the information after the interruption. 
That's one of the reasons the interrupter doesn't break the flow of the main sentence. Also, notice in the following example how the interrupter flows into the predicate after the second dash because they share related information. It's all about the obnoxious shrieks. The shrieks of the seagulls that night in Brunswick Harbor, as obnoxious a noise as I've ever heard in my life, kept me up late into the night. Interrupters are a good place to remember reader sensitivity. Keep in mind that your reader is trying to connect the information that precedes the interrupter with the information that follows it. Try to make it easy on them. Here's an example of an interrupter that ruins the flow of the sentence and makes life difficult or confusing for the reader. Greg Maddox of the Atlanta Braves, the subject of an excellent Punch Brothers song about the art of pitching titled Movement and Location, won the Cy Young Award several times. Believe it or not, that somewhat clunky example is a grammatical sentence. It's just not a great one because the interrupter is unrelated to the phrase after it, won the Cy Young Award several times, which completes the base clause the sentence begins with. By the time the reader gets to the verb, won, the interrupter may have tricked some readers into thinking that the Punch Brothers song won the Cy Young Award. This, as all baseball fans will know, is impossible, as the Cy Young Award is the honor that goes to the best pitcher of the year. The sentence is trying to convey that Greg Maddox won the award several times, but that point may get jumbled up by a confusing interrupter. This can be fixed in one of two ways, by simply not including tangential interrupting information, or it can be fixed by offering the reader some help in remembering when they get to the second dash, like so. Greg Maddox of the Atlanta Braves, the subject of an excellent Punch Brothers song about the art of pitching titled Movement and Location, was a pitcher who won the Cy Young Award several times. It's still not the greatest sentence in the world, but it's far easier for the reader to follow and make sense of. Try to practice reader sensitivity whenever interrupting your base clauses. The last method of lengthening a base clause is by adding an introductory phrase or clause. You'll see these a lot in fiction, as they do an excellent job of setting the stage for the base clause of a sentence. Sometimes they begin with a prepositional phrase. Above the stony arch at the mouth of the pyramid's tunnel, a statue of two great snakes coiled in combat resides. You may have noticed that this long introduction to the base clause does a good job establishing a ground for the image later provided by the base clause. The stony arch gives the reader a ground to visualize and then populate with a figure, the two snakes coiled in combat. Introductory prepositional phrases are excellent tools for this type of image building. In addition to phrases that cue location, introductory phrases are a good way to help your readers orient the action along the timeline of the story. A few hours after Keith came over, he and Sandra were at each other's throats again, all fired up about the missing jewelry. Similarly, phrases and clauses introduced by conjunctions, like because, although, whenever, if, until, etc., these can answer questions like how, why, how often something happens, etc. Because Danny had a few too many beers, he handed the keys to Andre. Or, introductory phrases and clauses can express conditionals. Unless the caterers arrive within the hour, the mesners are going to have a wedding reception with no food. Sometimes you'll see some of these phrases and clauses as modifiers of the base clause. They don't always come at the beginning. Callie always oversleeps on the 5th of November, because her birthday is the day before. I tend to prefer moving one or more of these phrases to the beginning of the sentence, because I find it usually adds a touch of clarity, like so. Because her birthday is the day before, Callie always oversleeps on the 5th of November. Or, on the 5th of November, Callie always oversleeps, because her birthday is the day before. And there are times when moving a modifying clause to the beginning of a sentence can smooth it out tremendously. Tony spilled coffee all over his suit as soon as we were ready to go and had to change into another suit. Versus, as soon as we were ready to go, Tony spilled coffee all over his suit and had to change into another suit. All these techniques for expanding the base clause leave the writer with an extraordinary level of flexibility when it comes to constructing a sentence. Being sensitive to the reader's task of following your lead means thinking about how complex your base clause is. How far is your subject from your main verb, and what are you asking the reader to process in between? 
smooth, flowing prose generally never asks the reader to do too much. We'll get into some of the ways you can help your cause in this regard later in these sentence building lessons. But first, we're going to begin to explore a few ways we can grow our sentences beyond the base clause. This is where it starts to get interesting. We've seen how base clauses grow from the most basic kernel sentences into longer, more complex sentences with greater specificity and idea-carrying capacity. What sentences can also do is grow beyond their base clause. There are essentially two ways to do this, by connecting additional clauses or by adding loose modifying phrases. We'll get to loose modifiers soon enough and have a lot to say about them too, but for now we're going to stick with the clause theme. This lesson is about figuring how clauses connect and grow like links in a chain. But first, let's do a quick overview of what a clause is to refresh our grammar memories and to use that as a foundation for growth here. A clause is a group of words that has a subject and a predicate. What makes a sentence different from a clause is that a sentence, in addition to having a subject and a predicate, must also express a complete thought. Here's an example of the difference. Julia wondered a subject, a predicate, and a complete thought, who fell off the bed in the middle of the night, a subject, a predicate, but not a complete thought. This clause cannot stand on its own. It needs something else to complete it, like a question mark. Clauses that can stand on their own independently are called independent clauses, and clauses that depend on additional supporting information to complete them are called dependent clauses. One can elongate the base clause of a sentence by adding dependent or independent clauses to the base clause. Let's see how this might look for dependent clauses first. David wanted to know more about the snowmobile for sale, which Tiffany had told him about. Here, we've simply added clarifying information that informs the reader who told David about the snowmobile. This is a common tactic for growing a sentence beyond the base clause, and theoretically, if one so desired, one could continue to connect dependent clauses to this sentence for a long, long time. David wanted to know more about the snowmobile for sale, which Tiffany had told him about, because she'd heard about it from her father, who worked with a guy from the North Country who went snowmobiling every weekend in February, which is a great month for snowmobiling with new friends, who will usually have a very nice time learning the sport, which is growing more and more popular with millennials. That sentence is grammatical, and... It would continue to be grammatical for about as long as I cared to keep that train rolling, but dear God, Ro, why would you do such a thing? There's a good reason you don't see a thousand dependent clauses strung together like that very often. If we're thinking at all about reader sensitivity, and we should be, we can easily say that this is not a smooth, enjoyable spin around the dance floor. The reader's focus, which begins with David and a snowmobile, gets moved from David to Tiffany, then her father, then a guy from the North Country, and by the time we're done, David has been left in the dust, and so has a lot of very specific yet irrelevant information the reader has very little reason to care about. It's a monstrosity, and probably not the most effective way to grow a sentence into something aesthetically pleasing. But these dependent clauses are very good for conveying specific information. Last Thursday, at midnight, Mario was present at the club which was nearly empty when the defendant entered and began speaking to the victim, who was sitting in the corner opposite the entrance with a few of his colleagues, all of whom were very drunk. Again, the reader's focus shifts from Mario fairly quickly, but in this case, the specific information in each dependent clause tells the reader something important about Mario, that he was one of the few people at the club when the defendant entered, and that he saw the victim there with his drunk colleagues. Each of the dependent clauses informs the reader what Mario might know about the situation. Even though the sentence's focus shifts quite a bit, it's still quite a useful and informative sentence. And this is what dependent clauses are good for when added together like this. They can add precision and specificity at a time when both are needed. 
but there is probably a hard ceiling on how many of these dependent clauses you can stick together before your reader checks out. This is one way to add links to the chain. The next two ways to connect clauses involve independent clauses. These are clauses that could stand on their own as sentences. To join independent clauses, though, we're going to need a little help from a few friends, the colon, the semicolon, and the coordinating conjunctions. Let's begin with a look at how the colon and semicolon work, and then we'll slap a few independent clauses together and see what happens. One of the jobs of the semicolon is to join two independent clauses that are closely related. That could look something like this. The doctor gave me some troubling news about my lab results last week. Plus, she wasn't happy about my platelet counts being so low. Which would yield, the doctor gave me some troubling news about my lab results last week. She wasn't happy about my platelet counts being so low. It's important to keep in mind when using the semicolon to join two independent clauses that the information in both clauses should be closely related. A sentence like this is a non sequitur. The weather was amazing in Barbados. I really hate those short connection times when we fly through Atlanta. It's grammatical, yes, but there's no reason those two ideas should be joined. This could work, though. I really hate those short connection times when we fly through Atlanta. We had to sprint to catch our second flight. The colon does similar work to its sibling, the semicolon. One of the colon's main jobs is to join a second independent clause to a first independent clause in a way that clarifies or explains, like so. Kentucky claims to be the horse capital of the world. Every year, the Kentucky Derby is run in Louisville, offering up what is often called the most exciting two minutes in sports. One way to be sure that the use of a colon is correct is to replace the colon mentally with the phrase, that is. With the sentence above, it would sound like, Kentucky claims to be the horse capital of the world. That is, every year, the Kentucky Derby is run in Louisville, offering up what is often called the most exciting two minutes in sports. The second clause explains why Kentucky makes the claim in the first clause. If the second clause didn't explain the first, the that is would seem clunky and out of place, as below. Jared and Shana met each other at the airport bar. In his glass was a scotch, in hers an apple martini. Jared and Shana met each other at the airport bar. That is, in his glass was a scotch, in hers an apple martini. That just doesn't quite work. In this case, a semicolon would probably be better if you think these two independent clauses must be joined. Sometimes it's a tough call between a colon and a semicolon when joining independent clauses. And, truth be told, it's probably only the most scrupulous editor who would even notice if your semicolon should be a colon or vice versa. Like anything in writing, using constructions with colons and semicolons takes practice. Write 20 or so of each and it'll become part of your sentence game. The last and most common and useful way to join independent clauses is with a comma and a coordinating conjunction. This sentence construction is extremely versatile. Coordinating conjunctions are your friends, and luckily there are only seven of them, which makes them easy to memorize. Pause the lesson and say the following list ten times fast. And, but, or, for, nor, so, and yet. And, but, or, for, nor, so, and yet. And, but, or, for, nor, so, and yet. That should be stuck in your memory now. The coordinating conjunctions offer writers a great range of flexibility in the types of independent clauses they can connect. They allow you to add useful related information. The park on Sunset Boulevard has barbecue pits and picnic tables. And they allow pets. They let you add contrasting information. I was going to invite Sandra to my party on Friday, but I thought better of it when she cussed me out for no reason. They allow you to convey options. There's a movie starting in 10 minutes, or we could go to Sangria's and get a cocktail. They offer a good way to render an explanation. I couldn't figure out how to get the damn thing open, so I cracked the packaging with a hammer. You get the idea. Coordinating conjunctions are extremely useful. One thing to be mindful of here, though, is the temptation to grant other lesser words the coordinating conjunction's magical powers. One of the commonest writing mistakes is the dreaded comma splice, also known as a run-on sentence. This often happens when a writer treats another joining word like one of our seven magic words. This is a no-no. Bryant was a heavily sought-after bassoon player in the underground woodwind jazz scene. Also, to no one's surprise, he was a giant hipster. That's a run-on sentence as written. Nice try, also. 
Only our seven magic words can do that. This sentence would be fine with a semicolon, though. Bryant was a heavily sought-after bassoon player in the underground woodwind jazz scene. Also, to no one's surprise, he was a giant hipster. The problem with run-ons is that they confuse readers. The previous sentence isn't the worst offender, but it's definitely better with the semicolon. That lets the reader know that the first thought is complete. They can stop focusing on the subject and move on to the next thought following the semicolon. Conjunctions and punctuation, when used properly, serve as helpful guideposts to direct your reader's attention to changes in focus or the end of a complete thought. Using them well will help keep your reader in lockstep with you, the lead dancer. Those are the three ways you can grow your sentence by connecting clauses to the base clause. As we saw early in the lesson, there's a bit of a hard ceiling attention-wise when building sentences this way. Too many dependent clauses will strain your reader's attention dangerously close to the put-this-book-down-now threshold. We'll get to exactly why this is in a few lessons, but next, we're going to explore the most flexibly fluid way to make long, flowing, glorious sentences. When it comes to having command over the text, if there's any one sentence building skill that separates professional fiction writers from the droves of mediocre fiction writers, it's this one. If you examine the prose of master sentence writers, you'll inevitably find a writer with a mastery over loose modifying phrases, largely because they offer the writer tremendous flexibility in growing a sentence outward from its base clause. Sometimes called free modifiers, adjectival elongation, or cumulative syntax. Any of these terms refers to the use of loose modifiers. So what are these spectacular loose modifiers, Ro? I'll tell you. They are types of phrases that can be added to a sentence to modify all the elements in the base clause, subject, predicate, or other information within the base. Essentially, they can be added to modify anything, hence the term loose or free. And if that's not enticing enough to an aspiring sentence wizard who loves flexibility, they are incredibly easy to learn to use. If used correctly, loose modifiers can help you grow tremendously fluid and easy to follow sentences, which is one of the reasons you'll find loose modifying phrases all over the sentences of our very best fiction writers' work. The basic formula for adding a loose modifying phrase is simple. A. Take your base clause. The bear ran up the tree. B. Subtract the period and add a comma. The bear ran up the tree, comma. C. Add an adjectival phrase that modifies part or all of the base clause. The bear ran up the tree, its claws tearing into the delicate bark. Looks pretty simple, right? It is. And once you've mastered the types of constructions that can form loose modifying phrases, you could theoretically stretch a sentence infinitely. The bear ran up the tree, its claws tearing into the delicate bark as the bees pursued, their wings buzzing furiously around the bear's broad body, his thrashing limbs shaking the trunk as he progressed, lumbering upward with power and madness, huffing in anger as the bees swarmed, stinging the bear everywhere as he ripped great divots into the woods, claws scrambling, reaching higher and higher, bending the thin green boughs near the top of the lurching trunk. You may not consider that an elegant sentence, I certainly don't, but it is grammatical, and it does demonstrate the principle. Take your base clause, add a comma, plus a loose modifier, and repeat as necessary. Let's take another look at that long sentence about the bear. You may notice how each phrase relates to a phrase that precedes it. If this is done well, loose modifiers can be a good way to practice reader sensitivity as well. This is yet another advantage of loose modifiers. Note how the main thought at the end of one phrase can be carried right into the next phrase, taking the reader along without asking them to hold too much information in their short-term memory. Again, that sentence about the bear isn't high literary art, to be sure. 
and I wouldn't often write a sentence like it in a story, but for an 80-word sentence, it's not very difficult to follow. Loose modifiers can help you do that. So how do loose modifiers get formed? Not surprisingly, there are quite a few different ways that loose modifiers can be formed from a grammatical sense. We'll take a look here at four common ways to begin a loose modifying phrase, but it bears mentioning that this isn't an exhaustive list of the ways loose modifiers can be formed. They can be formed in any number of different creative ways. I illustrate these four because they are common and easy to learn to use, which should get you started. It is important to stress that the point here isn't to memorize each type of construction with the grammatical terminology that goes along with it. What we're trying to do is simply familiarize ourselves with some of the ways a loose modifying phrase can be formed. If you practice writing each form a few times, you'll begin to develop a sense for how these constructions work. There's a rhythm that will develop over time. It's a bit like learning scales in music. You play them repetitively at the beginning, and after a while, you get the hang of the sounds and the places the notes are on your instrument, and then you just begin to play. In the following examples, I'll use the same base clause so you can see how the different types of modifiers alter the sentence. As a tip of the cap to Hemingway, my base clause will be the boxer through a punch. Note how basic my base clause is. It has a clear subject, an action verb, and an object. Simple base clauses like this offer the reader a vivid image that the writer can then elaborate on using subsequent modifiers. Clear, declarative base clauses are a reader's best friend. Here goes. 1. Beginning the modifying phrase with a verbal. Verbals are usually ED or ING forms of a verb that cannot complete a sentence on their own. I'll stress the verbals in the following examples. The boxer threw a punch, dropping his opponent to the canvas. The boxer threw a punch, driven more by self-preservation than by any fading hope for glory. The boxer threw a punch, lurching forward explosively as sweat jumped from his body. The boxer threw a punch, striking at his opponent's chin like the piston of some tremendous machine. Note how the verbal can lead to adding very different clarifying information that adds detail to the sentence, from simple actions to colorful descriptions to metaphors. 2. Beginning the modifying phrase with an article. The boxer threw a punch, a punch that would make boxing history. The boxer threw a punch, the bell finally calling an end to the epic battle. The boxer threw a punch, a hopeless jab into empty space. In the case of the article, it's introducing a noun or an adjective noun pair that describes a specific element of the base clause. This is also an excellent way to practice reader sensitivity as it tightly controls the reader's focus by reiterating exactly what is being modified. When tightly controlled like this, a string of loose modifying phrases can be both very long and very easy to follow for the reader. 3. Beginning the modifying phrase with a possessive pronoun referring to the base clause. The boxer threw a punch, his arms screaming with fatigue. The boxer threw a punch, its desperation signaling the end of his reign as champion. Similar to the case of the last construction, the possessive pronoun introducing a loose modifier reminds the reader exactly what is being modified while adding detail to that original element in the base clause. 4. Beginning the modifying phrase with an adverb. The boxer threw a punch, desperately trying to ward off the champion's advance. The boxer threw a punch, carefully measuring his staggering opponent for the final blow. We'll revisit this use of the adverb again in a few lessons, because quite a few writers of prose, many of them very prominent, seem to frown quite heavily on the adverb's use. But using an adverb to begin a loose modifier can be an effective way to both add detail and manage a pleasing rhythm in a long, flowing sentence. Stringing modifiers together. You should probably be able to guess where this is going next. We've seen how adding single modifying phrases to a base clause works. Now we're going to string them together to add more detail. It works the same way as the initial rules. Remember from earlier that the basic form for adding loose modifiers is simple. A. Take your base clause the bear ran up the tree, b, subtract the period and add a comma, c, add an adjectival phrase that modifies part or all of the base clause. 
The bear ran up the tree, its claws tearing into the delicate bark. Now this time we're going to add some more loose modifiers. Instead of putting a period at the end of the first modifying phrase, we're going to put a comma and keep adding information that provides more detail to the sentence. The bear ran up the tree, its claws tearing into the delicate bark as the bees pursued, their wings buzzing furiously around the bear's broad body, his thrashing limbs shaking the trunk as he progressed, lumbering upward with power and madness, huffing in anger as the bees swarmed. And that's how you expand sentences beyond the base clause using loose modifiers. It's worth practicing generating each of these constructions, like musicians practice their scales, until they become almost second nature. Then move on to putting them together. It won't be long before you're building sentences you never thought yourself capable of producing. But there are a few pitfalls to be aware of. There are two common mistakes to watch out for when using loose modifying phrases. One, that they are phrases. Loose modifiers cannot be independent clauses, otherwise all you've done is create a comma splice, which is another term for a run-on sentence. Make sure your loose modifier is not an independent clause. Run-ons confuse readers. Instead of getting what they think will be clarifying or detailing information about the base clause or another modifier, the reader gets a whole new base clause. Then they're forced to pause to figure out which is the real base clause in the sentence. The second common problem with loose modifiers is called a dangling or misplaced modifier. This happens when the modifying phrase modifies the wrong thing, or something that's implied by the sentence but not stated directly. At times, the dangling modifier can be totally overlooked, as they often seem to make sense in some way. But sometimes they're nonsensical and even comical when you notice them. Take the following dangling modifier. Having won the championship, the team plane departed for Boston. Of course, out of context, this sentence seems nonsensical. Unless the team was competing in a competition for best team plane, most likely there's something off with this sentence. One of the things that's tricky with dangling and misplaced modifiers is that often they seem much more reasonable in context. Consider the following. It was almost a given in that seemingly endless moment the ball hung in the air. Of course it would clear the wall. There'd been an air about the soon-to-be champions the entire summer. A swagger. A certainty. Stepping onto the jetway earlier that afternoon, the manager told the pilots to keep the engines warm. Their enigmatic center fielder boasted during warm-ups that he hadn't even packed a change of underwear. Now their miracle season was complete. Having won the championship, the team plane departed for Boston. There was enough champagne on board to drown a herd of elephants, and the party wouldn't stop till the sun came up two days later. To my eyes, it's hardly noticeable in context. Often, we'll pass right over dangling modifiers as readers because we'll make the same logical leap that the writer did when he first wrote that paragraph. That writer was obviously thinking about the team winning the championship. The moral of the story is to do your best to know exactly what your loose modifier is modifying, and make sure it's actually present in your base clause. At other times, the problem is distance. The item being modified is present, but it's far away from the modifier, or there's something else in between that makes it difficult for the reader to understand what the modifier is modifying. Here's an example of a misplaced modifier. The fox bolted when he saw the farmer making a break for the woods before two shots rang out. It should be pretty easy to spot the problem here. The modifier making a break for the woods is too far away from its referent, the fox. Making this sentence worse is the fact that the farmer is mentioned in between the noun and its modifier, giving the reader the sense that the farmer made a break for the woods, not the fox. Let's see if we can fix this misplaced modifier. When he saw the farmer, the fox, bolted for the woods, making his escape before two shots rang out. Much better. The fox comes right before the loose modifier, making it less ambiguous and clearer to the reader. There are two good ways to deal with dangling or misplaced modifiers. Rewrite or restructure. One, we can rewrite the sentence so that the inferred element is present. Having won the championship, the team departed for Boston on their private plane. Two. We can restructure the sentence so that the problem with the loose modifier goes away. The team won the championship, and the plane departed for Boston. Victory in hand once more, the team boarded their Boston-bound private plane and departed. 
So those are the basics of using loose modifying phrases. This is a skill that once mastered will add tremendous fluidity, flexibility, and clarity to your sentence writing chops. So go practice, and when you're ready to add some new moves, come back and see the kind of next level stuff you can do with loose modifiers. Now that we've discussed how to form sentences that make use of loose modifiers, we're going to look at the different ways they can be constructed to create movement within a sentence. I want to emphasize that the pieces here are all the same, a base clause plus loose modifying phrases. The question we'll be dealing with in this lesson is, what are the different ways we can arrange those pieces, and what are the effects when we do arrange loose modifiers differently? Managing focus with modifiers. The base clause will usually be the focus of the sentence, but loose modifiers are an excellent tool to manage exactly what elements the reader focuses on and with what level of detail. With loose modifiers, you essentially have a spectrum to play with when it comes to managing focus. On the one hand, a writer can use the modifier to zoom the focus in on the base clause, adding more and more detailed description of an element in the base with each successive modifier. On the other hand, a writer can move the focus away from the base clause by modifying elements in each successive modifier, eventually leaving the imagery in the base clause behind. Lastly, a mix of these two types of loose modifiers can create a middle ground in terms of the reader's focus. So let's get specific so you can see what I mean. Take our familiar base clause as an example. The bear ran up the tree. Your loose modifiers can narrow the focus on the elements of the base clause by modifying the base clause. The bear ran up the tree, his claws digging into the bark, his powerful muscles flexing as he struggled grasping upward in the hopes of escape. Each of the three modifiers refers back to the bear in that moment. Note how the sentence stays with the bear. The reader remains focused on the ideas in that base clause. There is increasingly greater detail about the base clause, but no movement forward from that moment. The bear ran up the tree, his claws digging into the bark, his powerful muscles flexing as he struggled, grasping upward in the hopes of escape. On the other hand, the modifiers can shift the focus by changing the target of the modifier with each successive element added. This would sound something like this. The bear ran up the tree, his claws tearing into the delicate bark as the bees buzzed furiously around, their wings humming in a cloud-like blur, encircling the entire massive old beech tree on the eastern side of the mountain. Each of the three modifiers refers to the new information added in the modifying clause, Note how the sentence moves away from the bear. The reader's focus moves from the bear to the bee's wings, to the cloud-like blur around the beech tree, and then to the mountain. The bear totally gets left behind in the span of three loose modifiers, even though he's the subject of the sentence. The bear ran up the tree, his claws tearing into the delicate bark as the bees buzzed furiously around, their wings humming in a cloud-like blur encircling the entire massive old beech tree on the eastern side of the mountain. Those are the two extreme ends of that focal spectrum, essentially zooming in or zooming out in the level of detail with respect to the base clause. Mixing modifiers that refer to the base and successive modifiers will create a sentence that finds a middle ground. The bear ran up the tree, his claws tearing into the delicate bark as the bees pursued, their wings buzzing furiously around the bear's broad body, his thrashing limbs shaking the trunk as he progressed, lumbering upward with power and madness, huffing in anger as the bees swarmed, stinging the bear everywhere as he ripped great divots into the woods, splinters flying from the bark. The modifiers in this sentence refer to both the base and to other modifiers broadening the picture in order to create movement and add greater detail when desired. 
Because of the flexibility of this form, it's more common to see mixed loose modifying sentences, but it's really about where the writer wants to lead the reader's focus. Do they want the focus to stay fixed on that base clause, narrowing in on that moment with greater detail, or do they want to move the reader's focus away from that moment, or do they want to do both? So, depending on how the writer chooses to modify the base clause, the sentence can create a sense of movement to the reader's focus. There are also a few ways the writer can change the character of a sentence by shifting the base clause's position. Here are three different ways to position your base clause for effect. Right branching. This is the easy part. If you think of the base clause as the seed of the sentence and the modifiers as the tree that branches out from that seed, you can begin to categorize sentences by the position of the base clause. Right branching sentences start with the base clause at the beginning and move forward from there. Ronaldo ate that sandwich in three huge bites, like Pac-Man, gobbling down roast beef and mustard in massive gulps, teeth chomping, eyes wide, exhibiting a huge look of satisfaction after two days in the wilderness with no food, the overwhelming joy of his rescue there for everyone to witness. The beauty of this form is that it's tremendously useful in moving the reader forward. When the modifiers are well constructed and rhythmical, the sentence seems to flow forward from that initial proposition, carrying the reader effortlessly through the progression of the story, shifting from the first idea to the next, a sequence of micro scenes unfolding in the reader's mind with almost every new modifier. See what I did there? Here's Melville again, painting a nice scene with a right branching sentence. It is a quiet noon scene among the Isles of the Pacific. A French whaler anchored inshore in a calm and lazily taking water on board, the loosened sails of the ship and the long leaves of the palms in the background, both drooping together in the breezeless air. Left branching. I bet you can guess where this is going. Left branching sentences are the opposite, of course. The sentence begins with a sequence of modifiers. Sometimes it can be one or two, sometimes more. Barreling backwards toward the guardrail, brakes grinding, tires squealing, matched by the guttural wail of the terrified young mother clutching her tiny infant, Morris desperately turning the wheel to recover control, pounding his feet on the impotent brake pedal, a feeling of impossible tension in his gut. Morris's taxi was about to crash. The big difference here, I'm sure you noticed, is that the main idea of the sentence is delayed until the end. This gives the effect of presenting something I guess you could call micro-suspense. Something is clearly happening, and as the sentence progresses, the picture begins to become more complete, with details slowly adding to the reader's anticipation of the outcome. Then, at the end, we learn. A potential issue of which to be wary with left-branching sentences is the very suspense they generate. Like the suspense of a good plot, the reader will anticipate a payoff at the climax. A truly good left-branching sentence will usually end with a punch. To use a bowling analogy, writers should not be in the habit of setting up pins they fail to knock down. Show us how it's done, Herman. Here's another sentence from Moby Dick where Ishmael describes the look of several boisterous, newly returned sailors he encounters in a bar. I just love this sentence for the same type of micro-suspense. The description creates an image at the beginning, delaying the payoff of the base clause while adding details as it approaches the punchline. Enveloped in their shaggy watch coats and with their heads muffled in woolen comforters, all bedarned and ragged, their beards stiff with icicles, they seemed an eruption of bears from Labrador. Mid-branching. Following on from the pattern, you've probably guessed that a mid-branching sentence begins with a modifier or modifiers, then presents the base clause. After the base clause, the sentence continues on to add descriptive details. This form is particularly useful in moving from completed actions in the past to other past actions that are closer to the present. Having completed her homework and having walked her younger siblings home from the bus stop, Mary Ellen went out to play, delighting in the only free time she had, dangling off the jungle gym, flying down the slide and soaring as high as she could on the swing set all in the hopes that time would stand still for just a little while before she was called to dinner. Or, this form can be used to add unexpected variation in descriptive sentences. 
resting with her feet outstretched in the warm Caribbean sand, her eyes shaded from the sun by the overhanging palms, her bleached hair tucked behind her browning neckline, Noel closed her eyes, allowing her thoughts to drift back to her New England homestead, the mounting drifts of snow, dangling icicles creeping downward from the edge of her gutters, her neighbor's frosty breath expanding puff by puff as they started their cars each morning, the low, hazy sun in the sky. She could really get used to Barbados. One thing to be especially careful of with this form is loose and dangling modifiers. Make sure each modifier is clear in what it's describing. When used properly, a mid-branching loose modifier can add descriptive force and specificity to a narrative. Let's let Melville finish off this syntactical trifecta properly. Like Mark Antony, for days and days along his green-turfed, flowery Nile, he indolently floats, openly toying with his red-cheeked Cleopatra, ripening his apricot thigh on the sunny deck. Expert writers can use all these different types of loose modifiers to create a desired effect at the sentence level. Again, these syntactical choices are another example of the type of infinite complexity that can emerge in a combinatorial system. There are really only six options here. Keep the focus on the base, move the focus away from the base, or mixed, left branching, right branching, or mid branching. Yet those options can produce an infinite number of unique sentences, each with its own syntactic nuance. In case you haven't guessed already, I'll say it. I think this stuff is very cool, but a book nerd would. And just like learning how each type of loose modifier can be formed, practicing writing each of these forms will give every writer tremendous flexibility at the sentence level when it comes time to write their next story. I'm going to do my best to be both as clear and as brief as possible on this topic, because it can be confusing and vast in its complexity. I think it's important, though. To me, it seems vital to have a basic understanding of the mental process of reading. Your writing places difficult cognitive demands on your readers, and understanding those demands will help you to write clearer, more readable prose. It also helps to explain why certain sentence structures are more pleasing to readers than others. So here goes. The first place to start is with the term working memory. Another way to think of this cognitive system might be as the container of your conscious mind. It's the stuff you're thinking about right now, and it's the place in which you live your life, every waking moment from now until the day you die. Pretty heavy, eh? Now, not to get too philosophical about it, but this container is very, very small compared to the totality of knowledge in your awesome brain. And you can test how big your working memory is very easily online. Usually these tests use random word generators. Cat, Himalayas, giraffe, ocean, patience, farm, etc. And your job is to retain those items in your cognitive container and repeat them back to the tester. The more you get right, the better your working memory. For our purposes, let's call our working memory capacity 7, because that's about the number of things the average mind can hold in a test like that. It's one of the reasons phone numbers are 7 digits long. If they were any longer, people wouldn't be able to remember them. Not that they have to anymore. The conscious act of reading takes place in this same container, the same container that under ideal circumstances can hold about 7 things for a few seconds at best before all those things go leaking out and other things come pouring in. Like the laundry you forgot to do, the fact that you want a coffee, and that stupid insurance company jingle you're trying to get out of your head. Point being, this container, as spectacularly complex and wondrous a thing it is from a cognitive and evolutionary standpoint, it's also very limited for our purposes as readers and writers. But there's hope. We do read and write pretty well for glorified chimpanzees, after all. One of the things that has helped us to read so well is a cognitive trick called chunking. 
We perform this trick almost automatically. Let's take that phone number example, for example. You have a number, 5983418. You wouldn't actually tell someone your phone number like that, right? Instead, you'd say 5983418. Essentially, you've just chunked seven digits into five numbers, and you can hold those numbers in your cognitive container for quite a bit longer now, and with less effort, too. You've chunked down the data and freed up some cognitive space for other things. That's important to remember when writing, because we're all dealing with the same problem as our readers. Our cognitive containers can only hold so much. Reading is not a task we perform naturally, which is why it takes 16 years to learn to do it fairly competently and far longer to do it well. Writing systems have evolved separately only a handful of times in the course of human history, and only once has an alphabetic system evolved. Everyone else had to learn the alphabetic system of writing from those original progenitors. It's pretty incredible to think about. So we're not naturally built to read and write sentences the same way speech is instinctive to humans. This means it takes a tremendous amount of cognitive capital to read. It is a skill acquired with tremendous lifelong effort. This is also why very few people speak in complete sentences, much less complex sentences. And they only do it after many years of cognitive training, mostly on how to write, because writing teaches you how to form sentences. If you've had kids or been around them, you know how difficult it is when they're first trying to sound out words. It takes them forever to read a sentence, because they need to pronounce and then string together each syllable. Then, as they get better at recognizing letters, they begin to recognize groups of letters, called consonant clusters, and then begin to chunk groups of clusters together. Reading gets a little easier when this happens. Then, kids read so many words, usually sometime in middle or high school, that they don't process the letters anymore, just the words. Essentially, we've trained to read so much that the letters and words part of the cognitive challenge now takes us zero cognitive capital. That frees up a lot of space in our cognitive container to do other things, like process more complex sentence constructions and more complex ideas. Great. So what does this have to do with rhythm in sentences and parallel construction? Check out these two sentences. Essentially, they contain nearly identical information, but one sentence is parallel and the other isn't. The president promised to reform health care, to preserve Social Security, and to balance the budget. Versus, the president promised to reform health care, the preservation of Social Security, and legislation mandating a balanced budget. They're both grammatically correct, but when I read those two sentences in sequence, the second seems like somebody threw on the brakes. Did you notice that? The parallel construction is much faster. But why? If you guess that it has something to do with the limited amount of space in your working memory and chunking, well done, you got it. The first sentence is a parallel construction. As you begin reading it, you process the subject and the verb first, president promised. You're going to hold that in your working memory because you recognize it as the most important part of the sentence. Then you move on. Next you notice the infinitive phrase, to reform. Reform what? Healthcare. Okay, good. But there's a comma. You know something else is coming. To preserve Social Security. Great. Sounds like a good deal. What's next? Another comma and an and. You've seen that construction before, and you know what it means. It means another infinitive phrase, to something, is coming. And no surprises here, you get, to balance the budget. At this point, you can ignore the grammatical constructions because they're identical. Your mind is now free to chunk the information as you process the full meaning of the sentence. President promised, health care, social security, balanced budget. You've essentially got four items to carry in your cognitive container, which leave some room left over to process extra things like what that means for the country or whatever. In the second sentence, a faulty parallel, you process the subject and the verb in the same way, president promised. Next comes the infinitive phrase, to reform health care, just as in the first sentence. Only this time when you get to the comma, there's something different after it. Instead of another familiar infinitive phrase, you get the preservation of social security, a rather abstract noun phrase. Now your working memory needs to do more than simply add another item to a list. Your cognitive container needs to process the difference between these two grammatical constructions 
and extract the meaning of these two items at the same time. That takes a lot more cognitive capital. The reader will experience this as the sensation of slowing down. Things get even more difficult for the reader when they get to the third item in the series, which is another faulty parallel noun phrase. Then, if that's not enough, your reader's brain must process all three of these mismatched items within the context of the original proposition, the president's promises, no small cognitive feat. If you think of this as mental juggling, that second sentence throws a lot of spinning knives, bowling pins, and chainsaws into the air, and good luck catching them all. So why not do your reader a favor and try to form sentences that only fill up the cognitive container halfway? Let's look at another faulty parallel to hammer this point home. Marta loved watching the marathoners running past in April, the Independence Day parade in July, and observing the Veterans Day procession in November. That sentence is grammatically correct, technically, but it's not doing the reader any favors, which, in turn, does the writer no favors either. This is how a reader gets frustrated and puts down the writer's book. The reader will process that first line, Marta loved watching, and think, Marta loved watching what? Then comes the list of three items. Let's examine each of these three items individually. Marta loved watching, the marathoners running past in April the Independence Day Parade in July, observing the Veterans Day procession in November. Common to all three elements in the series is a month of the year, so we can keep that commonality. They also start with the article the, which we'll keep as well. Grammatically, the three items are different though. One is a noun phrase, and the other two are gerund phrases. I'm going to turn those two gerunds into noun phrases because we already have a gerund, watching, that precedes the list. Let's make this list parallel. The Marathon in April, the Independence Day Parade in July, the Veterans Day Procession in November. And see if you can hear how much easier this sentence reads. Marta loved watching the Marathon in April, the Independence Day Parade in July, and the Veterans Day Procession in November. Parallel construction is one of several common sentence constructions that help make prose flow more freely. A big reason for this is that syntactic similarity reduces your reader's cognitive load. Smooth, flowing prose has a rhythm to it that stems both from the ease of syntactically similar constructions and from your reader's expectation of their appearance. Parallel constructions aren't the only syntactic patterns that help your sentences flow smoothly. We'll look at a few more great constructions in the next lesson. Last lesson we covered the cognitive reasons for certain effective patterns being prevalent in the sentences of great writers. This time, we'll get into that phenomenon at the level of phrases, rhythms and patterns within phrases, and schemes of repetition within sentences. Like music, sentences have rhythm, so it should follow that, like good music, good sentences have good rhythm. With great writers, sometimes you can just hear the mastery and the rhythm of their sentences if you read them aloud. Sometimes you don't even need to read them aloud. I could read Virginia Woolf all day and never care if I understood a word of it. She has such a mastery over the rhythm of her prose, it almost begs to be sung. F. Scott Fitzgerald, for as much as I'm not the world's biggest fan of his command of story elements, I cannot deny he composed The Great Gatsby with a level of rhythmic mastery at the sentence level that is rarely achieved. All of this can't be taught in a single lesson, that's for sure, or even a series of them for that matter, but it can get you thinking about rhythms and patterns in prose and help you to start building a solid foundation. Parallel rhetorical or rhythmical elements come in many forms and rhythms, and these constructions generally fall under the broad term isocolon. Like beats in music, sentences proceed through time, one beat after another. The basic unit in prose, as in poetry, is the syllable. 
And we'll start our look at the syllabic rhythm of prose by focusing on perhaps the commonest of rhetorical schemes, the tricolon. Tricolon. You've seen tricolon a lot in stories, in textbooks, and in this sentence as well. As a matter of fact, that last sentence was a tricolon. Let's look at it again. You've seen tricolon a lot in stories, in textbooks, and in this sentence as well. Lists of three things are so common that a mention of two items rarely seems complete without the third. And as the prefix tri in tricolon denotes, this construction is about lists of three. But there's something else about that tricolon we started with. It's arranged in a specific rhythmic way. Look at the number of syllables. In stories, in textbooks, and in this sentence as well. Three, three, and seven. And just so you can't accuse me of fabricating this silly idea, here's Melville doing the same thing while describing the burst of a whale's jet on the horizon. But calm, snow white, and unvarying, still directing its fountain of feathers to the sky, still beckoning us on from before, the solitary jet would at times be descried. Can you feel the rhythm in that initial tricolon to start the sentence? Calm, snow white, and unvarying? That construction is often called an ascending tricolon, or sometimes a tricolon crescendo. Musicians will be familiar with that terminology, which signals to a musician to play gradually louder. Whenever a musician sees the crescendo symbol written on their sheet music, they're supposed to play gradually louder. Similarly, writers make their syllable count grow longer in a tricolon crescendo. If it sounds complicated, don't worry, it's not really that complicated. It boils down to this. If you have a list of three things, you put the shortest item first, the next shortest next, and the longest item after the conjunction. For example, let's say that you're writing about George and Myra, who are looking to adopt a dog from a shelter. They've narrowed their choice down to three breeds, Basset Hound, Pug, American Terrier. You could put those three breed names in any order, but it's probably best listed like this. George and Myra couldn't decide which breed of dog to adopt, but they'd narrowed it down to a pug, a basset hound, or an American terrier. Piece of cake, right? Just as in music, when you play louder, you can play softer as well. The opposite construction, not surprisingly, is called descending tricolon, or tricolon diminuendo, or decrescendo. And also, not surprisingly, it works from the longest item to the shortest. As we were plummeting, all I could think about was the warning sign posted at the roller coaster's entrance, grave bodily injury, heart palpitations, or death. You can probably hear from that descending tricolon that this construction is an excellent choice when you really want to emphasize that last item in the series, grave bodily injury, heart palpitations, or death. It may or may not come as a surprise to you, but many great fiction writers, at least implicitly, pay close attention to the rhythms and patterns in their prose, but they do. Often the best word choice isn't just about selecting a word with the precise meaning. Sometimes it's about the sound and rhythm of the word, too. Finding a balance between the right meaning and the right rhythm in a sentence can be a critical part of revision. Patterns of Repetition Repetition is another common element in great writing. Similar to parallelism, Repetitive patterns are easy to recognize and process, and sometimes they allow a writer to play with the rhythm in the same way a tricolon or similar list does. They come with complex technical names like anaphora, polysyndeton, chiasma, apanalepsis, and other ridiculous titles I wouldn't suggest you learn. What's important to understand is that, like parallelism, these repetitive patterns usually just share a similar grammatical construction or word, like beginning a phrase with the same word for effect. All that most maddens and torments, all that stirs up the lees of things, all truth with malice in it, all that cracks the sinews and cakes the brain, all the subtle demonisms of life and thought, all evil, to crazy Ahab, were visibly personified and made practically assailable in Moby Dick. Like repeating the same word to emphasize the diversity within a category, there were contestants wearing gorgeous evening gowns, contestants wearing tight jeans and cute little 80s-style tube tops, contestants wearing perfectly form-fitting black ballet leotards, and I was the contestant 
who looked an awful lot like a pear wearing baggy green scrubs and a brownish green top that wasn't nearly baggy enough to hide the ten years I had on all these younger girls. Like repeating the same conjunction to connect words or phrases for various effects. They were nearly all whalemen, chief mates and second mates and third mates, and sea carpenters and sea coopers and sea blacksmiths and harpooners and shipkeepers, a brown and brawny company with bosky beards, an unshorn saggy set, all wearing monkey jackets for morning gowns. Like repeating the same word at the end of the clause. In their waking hours, all the Warsaw Four could think about was chess. They calculated chess, they contemplated chess, they cogitated chess. And at night, when they couldn't stay awake any longer, they dreamed chess. Like repeating different forms of the same word within the same clause. My grandfather was fond of saying that a school of divinity never made a man divine, just as a scientist never made science, and a mountaineer never once made a mountain. But a drinker often made a drunk, which must have seemed achievable to me, for that's what I became. Like using similarly constructed modifiers. I've had it up to here with that bug-eyed, pig-headed, donkey-faced judge. Here's Melville dropping one of these into a description of wild horses. Most famous in our western annals and Indian traditions is that white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk-white charger, large-eyed, small-headed, bluff-chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in his lofty, over-scorning carriage. Again, there are far more ways to generate pattern repetition in your sentences than we can speak about here. This is merely a quick lesson designed to open a door. On rhythm, again, our poet cousins can teach us much. Listening to the rhythm of our greatest poets can only help your prose. Then you might apply the technique of syllable counting where you find your prose getting clunky. There are also far more comprehensive lessons on rhetorical schemes and patterns out there if you're interested in learning more. Rhythm and patterns offer your reader a chance to get in step with the words you've put on the page. Familiar rhythmic patterns help to ensure your reader's cognitive container never gets overloaded, and when done right, they are the unsung heroes of the greatest sentences ever written, hiding there in plain sight, keeping the ideas and images on beat, adding a musical, even poetic element to our prose. Avoid axioms. Ha! Now you have a conundrum. Because we're going to talk about the most common writing axioms going. Next to that one about needless words, that is. The first two usually go something like, don't use the passive voice, and don't use adverbs. Is that good advice, though? When it is, it's really good advice. But when it's not, it's not. The trick with all these writing conventions is to understand the logic undergirding the axioms and to write with that logic in mind. So what's this deal with the passive voice? The conventional wisdom is that it lacks force. Stephen King says so, and he's far from alone in this assessment. If English teachers got an extra dime for every time they said don't use the passive voice or scratched out a passive verb on a paper, they might not complain about being underpaid ever again. Mr. King chalks up the overuse of passive verbs to timidity, and he recommends that the writer get over the insecurity. He writes, I think unsure writers also feel the passive voice somehow lends their work authority, or perhaps even a quality of majesty. If you find instruction manuals and lawyers' torts majestic, I guess it does. One of the examples King gives of an acceptable case of a passive verb, unsurprisingly, concerns a dead body. The body was carried from the kitchen and placed on the parlor sofa. Is a fair way to put this, although was carried and was placed, still irk the shit out of me. I accept them, but I don't embrace them. What I would embrace is Freddie and Myra carried the body out of the kitchen and laid it on the parlor sofa. Why does the body have to be the subject of the sentence anyway? It's dead, for Christ's sake. 
except, respectfully, Mr. King, that sometimes the body needs to be the subject of the sentence, such as when a group of investigators are talking about the body. The body was moved three days ago is a perfectly reasonable sentence, especially when the investigators have no idea who might have moved the body yet. King's point about active verbs carrying more force is well taken, and their habitual use generally conveys more forceful writing. But to take this generalization as an edict neglects the occasion where a passive verb is the better choice. After all, if the passive voice didn't have a useful function other than to annoy successful writers and middling English teachers, it would have long since faded out of use. The eminent cognitive scientist Steven Pinker makes a good case for the utility of the passive voice, highlighting its main function, to allow the writer to direct the reader's focus onto the subject of the sentence. He writes, Actives and passives differ in which character gets to be the subject, and hence which starts out in the reader's mental spotlight. An active construction trains the reader's gaze on someone who is doing something. See that lady with the shopping bag? She's pelting a mime with zucchini. The passive trains the reader's gaze on someone who's having something done to him. See that mime? He's being pelted with zucchini by the lady with the shopping bag. And the reality is that sometimes things are going to happen to your characters. Here's an example. Randall's leg had been fractured in the accident, causing him tremendous pain over the past few weeks. It might be a struggle to find a better way of stating this with an act of construction. Maybe something like, In the accident, a collision with the dashboard had fractured Randall's femur, causing him tremendous pain over the past few weeks. Is that better? Not really. It also shifts the focus away from poor Randall, who sits there broken-legged and now seems less important than the collision that broke his leg in the first place. So what can we take away from this heated Stephen-on-Stephen -Stephen grammatical showdown? They actually both agree with each other, mostly. Consistent use of the passive voice will weaken the force of your writing, which is why people repeat the axiom, but never let an axiom get in the way of good common sense. When it's used to a purpose, the passive voice can be your friend. Understanding the purpose is the point here. This is almost the same question that we wrestled with when talking about viewpoint. Maintain command over the place you wish to put your reader's focus, and passives likely won't be a problem in your writing. Stephen King, I suspect, would agree. Begrudgingly. Begrudgingly? Begrudgingly? Oh, come on, Ro, now you're just trying to get under my skin, fictional Stephen King would surely say. Because Stephen doesn't like adverbs much either. You're right, Stephen, that was a low blow, designed specifically to wind you up, as are the two adverbs in this sentence. Ha <laughs> ha. Because if you're hard on passives, you're absolutely savage on adverbs. Seriously, though, Stephen, I think you're mostly right again here, too. And Stephen's not the only writer out there to wage war on the poor, weak, defenseless adverb. What did the adverb ever do to anyone, anyway? Well, Often the adverb gets thrown around as a way for a lazy writer to cover up a vague choice in verbs, as in, Gino went back to the car quickly, getting the gun from under the driver's seat. Well, I'm with you here, Stephen. That adverb, quickly, is damn lazy in this case. It's covering up for a poor choice in verbs, went. There are like a million verbs that describe the way people can get from point A to point B. Did Gino run, sprint, dash, dart, rush? Or maybe he just hurried. Point is, as a writer, you've got options here. Often, an adverb is more of a symptom of an underlying problem, a writer's lack of specificity with their word choice. Being in the ballpark isn't good enough if you want to be a good writer. You need to decide how your reader is going to envision Gino getting from point A to point B, and went is too vague. The writer knows it too, otherwise he wouldn't have qualified went, with that obnoxious adverb quickly. It's a crutch that a lazy writer is using to cover up for his unwillingness to command the situation with the type of precision excellent prose demands. In this case, Stephen's dead on. Pick a better verb. Went quickly is just the writer asking the reader to do his job for him. Sometimes, though, adverbs are the right tool for the job. Take the following sentence. Tread carefully whenever you deal with the syndicate, Spike said Jet. Our friend Jet has a point here. You don't want to mess with the syndicate. And you don't have many better options than tread carefully. 
Is there a verb that conveys that sentiment better? Tiptoe, sneak, pussyfoot, prevaricate. These might be synonyms in the thesaurus sense, but they don't convey the necessary connotations that go along with treading carefully in the way Jet means it. Is there a better way to say that? And is that going to sound natural in Jet's dialogue? Again, the axiom, don't use adverbs, fails us here. There are a couple other cases where it falls short as well. The first is that sometimes a creatively chosen adverb can add a descriptive image-bearing color to a sentence that a verb alone cannot. Two great ones come to mind from Moby Dick. With slouched hat, Ahab lurchingly paced the planks, mingling their mumblings with his own mastications. Thousands on thousands of sharks swarming round the dead leviathan smackingly feasted on its fatness. Lurchingly and smackingly, in these two cases, are adverbs that are perfect cues to help the reader visualize the action being conveyed. Ahab has a peg leg. Doesn't that pair of adverb and verb, lurchingly paced, exactly call to mind the image of a peg-legged old man walking up and down his deck? And in the second sentence, Ishmael is describing a feeding frenzy of sharks. If you've ever seen Shark Week, you know Melville just nails this description of how a swarm of sharks snaps at their food, smackingly feasting, calls this image to mind, dare I say it, perfectly? Can't you just picture their toothy jaws snapping shut on the carcass? Or check out this gem. The agonized whale goes into his flurry. The tow line is slackened, and the pitch puller, dropping astern, folds his hands and mutely watches the monster die. The adverb mutely is doubly perfect here. Removing it would both disrupt the obvious rhythm of the third tricolon element in this musical sentence, and it would weaken the descriptive force of the image. The pitch puller's folded hands and his silence, giving the reader a real sense of regret or remorse that comes with the slaughter. Subtracting this adverb would be a crime. Rhythm, as we could see in the previous example, is another place where adverbs can be your best friend. They can be an excellent tool for controlling and maintaining a pleasing rhythm in a sentence. Generally, they're polysyllabic, so if you have the right adverb with the right sound to it, they're the perfect word when you need a few syllables to make a sentence sound just right. We've seen this before. It is a quiet noon scene among the isles of the Pacific. A French whaler anchored inshore in a calm and lazily taking water on board. Note how the extra three syllables in the adverb lazily help to balance the rhythm here. The syllable count after the word whaler goes as follows two, two, three, and three, two, two, one, one. Removing the adverb wouldn't destroy this sentence, but there's no denying the rhythm of the sentence is better with it in there, and it's accurately descriptive fitting the quiet noon scene. And lest you think Melville is the only writer who works like this, you should check out F. Scott doing his thing. Slenderly, languidly, their hands set lightly on their hips, the two young women preceded us out onto a rosy-colored porch open toward the sunset, where four candles flickered on the table in the diminished wind. I am self-confessedly lukewarm on Fitzgerald, and on this book in particular, but I'd have to be either rhythmically challenged or fragrantly dishonest not to recognize the beauty of such a sentence. The magnificent image this sentence conjures of the two women sauntering onto the porch is echoed by the structure, a tricolon crescendo of loose modifiers to start this mid-branching sentence, and the rhythm is beautiful. Slenderly, languidly, their hands set lightly on their hips. It's almost as if these adverbs are here to delay the reader's arrival at the base clause. It's a slow walk outside with them. Fitz is escorting you there with this rhythm. You just can't do this without these adverbs. It sounds beautiful enough to make me ignore the reality that the meaning of that first adverb doesn't mesh very well with the verb. A sentence like, they slenderly preceded us, wouldn't make much sense. But Fitz somehow cheats those slender girls into that slow walk this way it's undeniably top class. You may also remember from our lesson on dialogue tags that Stephen didn't much care for adverbs in them either, which puts it mildly. Old F. Scott, though, defies the modern-day convention here, too. Well, these books are all scientific, insisted Tom, glancing at her impatiently. 
We've got to beat them down, whispered Daisy, winking ferociously toward the fervent sun. You ought to live in California, began Miss Baker, but Tom interrupted her by shifting heavily in his chair. I'll tell you a family secret, she whispered enthusiastically. It's about the butler's nose. Do you want to hear about the butler's nose? All four of those examples of adverbs and dialogue tags appear in the span of a page, and none of them are particularly offensive. They help the reader to grasp the subtext in this uncomfortable conversation Tom is foisting onto everyone else. Even without the rest of the context, you can see he doesn't take it well when his odious opinions are met with sarcasm and derision. He shifts heavily in his chair, and when Daisy gets the opportunity to change the subject, she jumps at it, whispering the family secret enthusiastically to make it perfectly clear to Tom, subtextually, that they'd much rather talk about something else. Adverbs are a tool, like any other tool the writer has at her disposal. To advocate for a writer not to use them is, I would say, almost poetically hypocritical. It's lazy teaching in the same way throwing adverbs around willy-nilly is lazy writing. Writers and teachers like Stephen King, who get annoyed by adverbs, actually aren't annoyed by the adverbs themselves. They're annoyed by the imprecision or diffidence that makes the adverbs necessary. As we've seen, they can help to produce beautifully rhythmical, image-laden prose that adds clarity to an otherwise ambiguous scene. To advocate for a writer to not use them is a bit like a shop teacher telling the kids not to touch the bandsaw. It's dangerous! Well, yeah, but it's also a damn good tool when you need to make certain cuts. To avoid it outright would be an act of the same timidity King rails against. You just don't want to be making every cut with the bandsaw. So too with the adverb. You're probably already noticing a pattern here. To everything, a season. So I'm going to ask you to keep that old axiom in mind when I promulgate a couple of my own. These have to do with the writer's treatment of the base clause. The first is that it's generally a good idea to keep your subject close to your verb. This speaks to reader sensitivity. It makes life easy on your reader, because as we've seen in this section, a huge part of what a reader is doing when they parse a sentence is figuring out the relationship between the subject and its verb. Essentially, a reader is trying to figure out what did what. When you give the reader the what and delay the did what, you're asking the reader to hold the subject in their cognitive container as they process the intervening information. Sometimes a brief interruption is okay, even useful. Consider this sentence as an example. Donna, for all her bluster, always comes to a sensible conclusion. In this case, it's a very brief interruption, and the interruption conveys critical information that colors the reader's interpretation of the predicate. It's as though Donna likes to kick up a fuss so much that one would think she's a downright unreasonable person. But the truth is that, in the end, Donna is reliable. If we'd followed the axiom in question, keep your subject close to your verb, the sentence might sound like this instead. For all her bluster, Donna always comes to a sensible conclusion. To my mind, this sentence is weaker. Notice how the first version emphasizes Donna by placing her first in the sentence. The first version also minimizes for all her bluster syntactically, which is appropriate considering the predicate is going to contradict it. This is a good place to bend our axiom, keep the subject close to the verb, to a specific purpose. Let's see how failing to do so might create problems for your reader. Jacob, entirely convinced of the justness of his cause, which prompted him to fits of rage when his ideology was contradicted, frequently driving him to rail against the government, a pit of vipers, the media, the willing tools of the elite, and the other political activists, a pack of braying fools, all of whose ideals were assumed to be entirely hypocritical and appalling, would dress in the manner of a 16th century town crier each Tuesday and shout the state's corruption from the steps of City Hall. Did you get all that? The base clause of that monstrosity is, Jacob would dress and shout. The major problem with this sentence is that it asks the reader to hold Jacob in the old cognitive container for a very long time before it offers the reader the main verb to which it connects. And in the meantime, there are a couple subordinate clauses, a long loose modifier with a list of complex items, a passive construction. Oh man! Why don't you just ask the reader to help you move on Saturday, dude? Parsing this sucker is a lot of work. It's perfectly grammatical writing. 
and it's just the type of perfectly grammatical writing that will turn your book into a doorstop. The moral of this story is to break apart subject and verb with caution and purpose. The second subject-related axiom is quite similar. This usually isn't a huge problem in fiction, but it's a major flaw in tons and tons of academic writing, from English 101 essays to papers by tenured professors in academic journals. The dreaded endless subject. Check it out. The idea that Cynthia could allow Thomas to come back into their lives after all the trouble he'd caused their entire family over the years was something that Constance, for all the support she'd lent her sister, frankly couldn't fathom. Blah! What a clunker! That entire 25-word noun phrase to begin the sentence is the subject. And compared to similarly offensive academic writing, this isn't even that egregious an affront to the writing gods. Jumble in a healthy dose of pretentiousness and the usual garbled jargon, and you've got yourself a published paper, Dr. Rowe. But seriously, this is such a simple fix. After all the trouble he'd caused them, Constance couldn't fathom that Cynthia would allow Thomas back into their lives. Again, most fiction writers know better than this, but, in the immortal words of Biggie, if you don't know, now you know. Keep those subjects snappy and clear, and your reader's cognitive container will be primed for actual useful information, like vivid images and lyrical, rhythmic prose. So those are the loose ends in these lessons on the sentence. I've got one more lesson to wrap up this session on the text. We'll do a bit of summing up, explore how you might put all this stuff to work for you, and attempt a modest philosophy of prose, which you can take with the amount of salt appropriate to such a vain idea. See you then. If these lessons on text are your first exposure to the art of sentence building, I can imagine it may seem like a lot. Like with any art, mastery of composing compelling prose involves long-acquired, hard-earned skills. My goal in this section was to cover the skills comprehensively enough that these lessons serve as a useful overview for the serious sentence mavens out there, without overwhelming or intimidating those writers for whom this topic might be new. Each of the elements discussed here is well-trod ground and can be studied in far greater depth than the scope of these lessons allow. No doubt, serious grammarians, linguists, and style experts will see gaps where deeper, more specific information could provide prose writers the greater breadth of knowledge that experts like Barry Tarshish, Steven Pinker, Virginia Tufte, and Brooks Landon have previously provided. This survey is intended merely as a clear, bird's-eye view for the experts and a roadmap for the uninitiated. By way of summing up, we began with the proposition that writing is a process of addition, which begins with a simple base clause. This can be expanded from within by adding modifiers, subordinate clauses or phrases, interrupters or introductory clauses or phrases. The base clause can also be expanded by adding other clauses or phrases to it in several ways. The writer can add subordinate clauses, which add detail and specificity. The writer can add coordinate clauses with the use of the seven coordinating conjunctions, and, but, or, for, nor, so, and yet. But the writer should add these clauses judiciously, as the reader's focus can be challenged by a bevy of these connecting clauses. The writer can also add coordinate clauses using a colon or semicolon. However, the clauses must be independent and closely related information. Lastly, the writer can expand the base clause using loose modifying phrases, adding detail with each successive modifier, creating a sense of movement to the sentence depending on the position of the base clause, offering the writer great flexibility in the style of prose they wish to present their reader. These are the options. From these limited options springs the infinite complexity we see in all the literature we know and love. Perhaps the only challenge fiction writers face that's comparable to the task of creating an interesting story is the struggle to present that story to the reader with adequately appealing prose. Thinking about reader sensitivity offers the writer a useful heading, 
a literary polar north, so to speak. Understanding how much your prose is taxing your reader's working memory helps the writer to compose sentences that are easier to process and appreciate. Clear, well-formed prose allows the reader the spare cognitive capital they need to think about, understand, and appreciate the story. A reader who is struggling to comprehend the words at the sentence level is unlikely to stick around long enough to appreciate the story a writer is trying to tell, no matter how great it may be. With all this in mind, writers can apply many of the tools we've discussed in this section to create prose that conveys the story clearly and with artistic intention. Here are a few time-tested ways to ensure your prose isn't overtaxing your reader's cognitive container. 1. Always knowing where you want your reader's focus to be at the start and end of sentences, and then connecting the end of one sentence to the start of the next, reader sensitivity. 2. Using short subjects instead of long noun phrases or abstract concepts. 3. Keeping your subject and verb close together, avoiding long or multiple subordinating phrases or clauses. 4. Using loose modifiers that aren't misplaced or dangling. That is, making certain the target of the modifier is clear so that the reader doesn't veer off course. 5. Using parallel constructions, especially in lists, so that the reader is using the least amount of cognitive capital possible to process the sentence construction. 6. Sticking to familiar conventional patterns with correlative pronouns or familiar pairs. Either or, neither nor, both and, on the one hand, on the other hand, etc. 7. Using familiar rhythmic patterns like tricolon crescendo and tricolon decrescendo. This can add both a pleasing musical quality to your sentences while helping your reader to anticipate the patterns in your sentences. Except for the first item in this list of suggested conventions, all these items pertain to the self-contained realm of the sentence. We've been discussing sentences almost exclusively in this section because the sentence is the most basic unit of fiction writing. Sentences are the cells of the story's body. They are that fundamental. It would be a tremendous oversight, though, if we didn't take some time to dwell on the importance of how sentences connect to each other. Here's an axiom worth considering as our next item on this list of useful prose conventions. 8. Vary your sentence length. Sentences don't exist in a vacuum. They connect to one another, of course. The very first axiom in our list of helpful prose conventions acknowledges this by cautioning the writer to manage the reader's focus. But it isn't just the reader's focus that must be accounted for between sentences. As we've seen, each sentence creates a rhythm of its own, and this poses an additional challenge and opportunity to the writer to create prose that varies rhythm from sentence to sentence. Managing rhythm between sentences is important in the same way suspense in great stories waxes and wanes or the color of a singer's voice pulls in the audience with a subtle beauty one minute and blows them away with emotive force the next. Similarly, a great long sentence can be complemented or even improved upon by a single short sentence of just a few words that follows it. Great writers manage rhythm in their prose by varying sentence length. Watch how Pulitzer Prize winner Anthony Doerr manages the rhythm in this paragraph from his masterful short story, The Shell Collector. At 16, burning for the reefs he had discovered in books like The Wonders of the Great Barrier, he left Whitehorse for good and crewed sailboats through the tropics, Sanibel Island, St. Lucia, the Batten Islands, Colombo, Bora Bora, Cairns, Mombasa, Morea. All this blind. His skin went brown, his hair white, his fingers, his senses, his mind, all of him, obsessed over the geometry of exoskeletons, the sculpture of calcium, the evolutionary rationale for ramps, spines, beads, whirls, folds. Notice how Dor sandwiches two very short monosyllabic sentences in between two long, elegant, list-focused sentences. This paragraph needs this break for several reasons. First, variance in syntax is necessary to keep the form from becoming too conspicuous. Imagine a book that had only long, ten-item, right-branching sentences composed entirely of loose modifiers. How many of those sentences could you read in a row before the form became monotonous? It would be like an orchestra playing the same note over and over for an hour. Ridiculous. Second, 
These short sentences give the reader a pause, mentally, between the two extensive lists that form this sentence sandwich. Those lists give the paragraph a sense of progression, all the places the character went, one after the other, and then later in the paragraph, this progression is echoed by all the things the character discovers about the shells he obsesses over. The second list mirrors the movement of the first. Sublime stuff to a sentence aficionado. This is a random paragraph I pulled from this story, not the climax or the opening, and it's not to say that any part of a short story is any less important than any other. I only mention this to say that this dude just writes like this, all the time, every paragraph like a Swiss watch in its intricacy. What happens when you write like that all the time? You move to Boise and win the Pulitzer Prize. No big deal. Bottom line, practice varying your sentence length. The more you do it, the more you'll get a feel for the rhythm of the prose style you like to write. Then you can start blending your sentences to create the kind of effects Door does above, and you'll really be able to hear those effects when you practice the ninth axiom in our list of ten. Read every sentence you write aloud. Perhaps the most important piece of writing advice one could ever give or get. Read every sentence you write aloud. It pays to remember that every written word owes its existence to a spoken word. Writing is merely a fossilized conversation with the writer the orator and the reader the listener. Speak your sentences aloud and let your ear be your guide. Writing is a physical artifact of the spoken word. 10. Build your own damn philosophy of prose. It's not that I can't be bothered to elucidate my own for you, because clearly Rose got no problem pontificating on the art of written fiction. But I'm not sure mine will do any good for you. You and I are different writers, and each writer needs her own philosophy, and your philosophy may be to leave such things unexplored, unarticulated, and undiscovered. Fair enough. I've always operated better with overarching principles to guide me, though. So I'll share mine for what it's worth. I mentioned at the outset of these lessons that I came to writing late, almost accidentally. In school, I'd never been a good writer. None of my teachers ever noticed my writing talent. It didn't exist when I was a student. The probability that I would even read books following college, much less write books, was fairly low. I had bad English teachers who failed to inspire any love for literature in me, and they sure as hell didn't teach me how to write. But, I fell in love with stories once I had the space to explore them on my own, absent the compulsion of term papers, pontificating lecturers, and overwrought symbolic interpretations. I began by teaching myself. I hoped to write the kinds of books I wanted to read, and over the course of several years of dedicated writing, I developed my own philosophy. My goal is to keep the reader's attention locked in. I would like for my prose to seem inevitable that as soon as the reader starts one of my stories, they fall into step from sentence to sentence, event to event, chapter to chapter, start to finish. They are dancing to the beat I set until the dance is complete, and when it's finished, the reader will remember this dance and remember enjoying it in some sense. Perhaps I'll fail catastrophically in this regard, but as I stated at the very beginning of these lessons, at least I have a target. You may want to set your target elsewhere when it comes to the words on the page. Or perhaps you think this is a nice target for you to shoot for too. A large part of choosing an aesthetic and a prose style should stem from the type of stories you aim to tell and the writer you want to be. Doubtless, your aspirations to write are unique. They'll likely be very different to mine. I'd encourage each writer to shape their style to both the stories they're trying to tell and the audience they hope will engage with their stories. Writers, especially literary writers, are often guilty of focusing on the writing at the expense of considering the readers engaging with their writing on the other end. Each audience will vary, just as the individual readers in that audience will bring their own schematic memories, interpretations, imaginations, and perhaps most importantly, their own skill level as a reader. The average reader just isn't built for Dostoevsky, and that's fine. For as much fuss as I kick up about Melville, he died a literary failure who'd gone nearly broke, much like the master, Henry James, who was so poor that he was bankrolled in the later years of his life by his far more successful friend and admirer, Edith Wharton. Her writing, still much appreciated today, 
was simply far more accessible than James's later work. I suppose I say all this to say, you choose the dance you want to lead, and it's up to you to gauge whether readers will want to follow. And to hell with anyone ignorant and pompous enough to denigrate your endeavor to write, or your readers who would choose to follow, whomever they may be. A useful philosophy of prose is not the one where Roe foists the Roean philosophy onto you or anyone else, but the one that hands you the tools presented here so that you may take them back to the stories and writers you most admire, so that you might explore how those texts work. My hope is that you'll discover how the great writing in the aesthetic you wish to work can be emulated and with careful study and time, surpassed. <laughs>